Hi guys, this is Troy from Australian Guitar Channel, chatting today to John Foreman, who's agreed to do this interview with me to talk music and his career. Thanks for doing this, John. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I want to ask you is, I mean, my first memories of you are when a friend of mine had your album, I think, that you made when you were 20 years old. Oh, right. Yep, that's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So what are your memories of that time and what, you know, kind of the timeline of how things happen, because I know you went to Sydney Conservatorium. Yeah. And the timeline of that album and then getting into TV and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, that, I loved making that album. This would have been like 90, 91, 92, 1991 yeah. or thereabouts. And it was called No Jiven. And um, I had the magnificent Mike Nock, who's one of our great, great jazz piano players and you know a great mentor who produced that and it was great fun and I, I really I loved working on that album with some great musicians and yeah it's a long long time ago and around about the same time I was just working around Sydney so I was in Newcastle then moved to Sydney and I was just doing sort of lots of live gigs mostly jazzy sort of gigs some of them were backing singers you know me backing singers um, and, you know, some of them were just in sort of jazz venues playing improvised jazz music. There was a little bit of jazz fusion stuff, you know, <laughs> where I'd play my, my um, oh, I probably had like a little DX7 Yamaha keyboard back then, you know, uh, very 1980s at the time. And just doing lots of live gigs. And one of the companies that I was working with was doing a, a gig with Bert Newton up at Twin Town Services Club. So I did that gig and that's how I met Bert and started doing all the TV stuff. So really it was like just being on that live scene and meeting lots of people helped me to get, you know, yeah. through to the TV side of things. So did Bert ask you to audition or did he just give you the gig? How did that actually work? No, it, it, uh, and this is something that, you know, a lot of young musicians sort of talk about or ask about is how, you know, how do you get work? How do you get, you know, from one gig to another? And... I've found 99% of the time it's word of mouth. So, you know, if you're looking for a keyboard player, you'll ask a keyboard player who you already work with. If they're not available, they'll suggest somebody else, you know, and that yeah. seems to be the way that it works. The gig with Bert came about just because I was working with that tour management company and they'd, they'd hired me on a few other gigs. So, no, I didn't audition for it. But then after doing this live show with Bert mm -hmm. up at Twin Town Services mm -hmm. Club where he was sort of... You know, he and Patty were doing, you know, like a little comedy comedy gig. He was negotiating with Channel 10 to come back to TV. So after that experience of working with him on the live show, that's where the TV thing came from. Okay. And were you studying at the same time? Did you study at the Sydney Con, if I got that right? I did, yeah, yeah. And so did you do a whole degree or what? how did that work? So I, I did my last two years of school were at Sydney Conservatorium High School, which was oh. fantastic, which I right. absolutely loved. And that was, you know, probably 80% classical study and 20% jazz contemporary study, but it was really more focused on the contemporary side of things. And I'd been studying, you know, my once a week piano lessons up to that point. And then I did, I don't know if, this, if the course exists in the same way now, but I did the two year associate diploma in jazz studies at Sydney Conservatorium. I think that's now a four year, three or four year course, but at the time it was just a two year course. And it really focused on improvisation, arranging and for me you know the chord structures for a jazzy kind of piano playing ability so mm -hmm. the the main things that I got out of that course from a knowledge point of view was really learning how to quickly access more complicated chords you know so that if I'd see a you know B flat 13 with a flat nine, I'd be able to find that voicing immediately without having to think, oh, wait a minute, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. That's, you know, right. so that's really, um, and I think once you know those chord structures, the improvisational side of it becomes a little bit easier too, because the, the, the knowledge is sort of inbuilt once you have those, those mm -hmm. chord structures. So do you call yourself a jazz player first and foremost? What's your forte? Are you more classical, oh, more jazz? What's your... I am not particularly skilled at any <laughs> style, okay. you know. Um, I did study classical music for quite a while and, you know, in year 12 I sort of had this moment of thinking, do I pursue the classical side of things? But it just seemed from a career point of view very kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that's where I moved into the jazz side of things. So for a couple of years, I would have called myself a jazz piano player, okay. you know, probably when I was like 16, 17, 18. Because um, that's, the, that's the majority of the gigs that I, that, you know, the majority of the gigs that I was doing at that stage were jazzy gigs, improvisational gigs and gigs that, you know, were in, in a, a jazz genre. And I'm glad I did because I think if you can play jazz that opens up your harmonic knowledge significantly and enables you to play a broader range of mm. music. So that was your time on, on Bert Newton. So yeah. fast forward, you were there for how long? Two and a half hours every day. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> well, you were there two yeah, and a half hours yeah, every day, yeah, yeah. but it was a pretty um, demanding gig, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it went for about 12 and a half. Well, I was there for about 12 and a half days. Right. And yes, it was you know quite time consuming because we would have you know, different artists on every day and some of them would be jazz performers, although they were rare. You know, you'd have pop artists, you'd have opera artists, you'd have, you know, country uh, performers. So from that point of view, it was great. And, uh, you know, to, going back to your earlier question, you know, what style of mu musician am I? At, at that point, I sort of had to learn quickly to become a sort of jack of all trades, if you like, in terms of not having a particular genre to be associated with. So if someone did come in wanting to do a you know, a, a three chord country song and have to play that in the manner that it was intended to be performed. And then, you know, the next day somebody might come on and sing Ness and Dormer and I'd have to work out how to get my head around that. Right. Too. So um, that was a good training ground. I bet, yeah. yeah. And so from there you went, once that finished, you went on to Australian Idol. Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There was a bit of a crossover for a couple of years where I was doing, um, you know, the morning show with Bert and then jumping up to do Idol. I'd usually take a couple of months off in the middle of the year to go and do the Idol show. And yeah, that was great. That was that was fun because it was sort of bringing live musicians back to, to yeah. primetime uh -huh. TV, which is great. You know, the, the format that we inherited from... Um, it was originally Pop Idol, a British show. I remember. Everybody knows American Idol, but it was originally, you know, the British Pop Idol. And the format, if I remember correctly, was... You know, once you got to the finals, the artists would perform with a backing track and then for one show there'd be a big band. Mm. You know, and each show had a theme, whether it was songs from the movies or songs from the 80s or whatever it was, you know, or rock week. And this week was big band week. And the audience loved it and the producers loved it. And I remember having a conversation with a music producer saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if we just kept the live musicians because we were creating live backing tracks every week right which again was good work you mm. know for a lot of musicians we'd you know we'd, we'd barrel into the studio every week and kind of like a live gig put down you know because there's not really the time if you have to record it all in a day and mix it in a day you know and you've got to do 12, 12, 12 tunes in a day really the only way to do it is to sort of smash them all out pretty quickly yeah right um so the thought was, well, what if we got the musicians and put them on stage live on the show? Wouldn't that be fun? Good for the audience, good for the yeah. players. And that's what ended up happening. Okay. So, yeah, it's a well, lot of good work for, for a lot of people. All right. You mentioned working with live musicians, which is something I really wanted to ask about. I mean, you've, I can't imagine how many people you've worked with. Like, what do you kind of expect? What do you ask of your musicians? What do you kind of um, just expect them to be able to do, show up and... Um, what's the prerequisite for anyone who works with you? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it depends a bit on the gig. Yeah. You know, they have to be able to play the gig that we're doing, whatever mm -hmm. that is. So, in other words, if, you know, I mean, I haven't done these for a while, but if it's, you know, if, you, if you're doing a, a, back in the day, a, a jazz band at a wedding, then you'd need to know the standards. You'd need to sort of know how to play effectively for that particular gig. You, mm -hmm. you know, um, you need to turn up on time, wear mm -hmm. the right outfit, you know. For the gigs nowadays, if it's, say, um, you know, uh, Carols by Candlelight or Back in the Day of Idol, those were reading gigs. So those are gigs where you'd need to be able to stick a sheet of music in front of somebody mm -hmm. and have them be able to sight read it. If it's a guitarist, because this is the Australian Guitar Channel, and I do apologise, I can't play guitar, and... I don't know how many people you have interviewed that are not guitarists. I feel None. like a bit you're the first one on your channel, no. so I apologise for that. But you know, I think for a guitarist, yes, the ability to read is very important for these sorts of gigs. But it's also the ability to find the right sound, uh -huh. especially if you're recreating a track, mm -hmm. you know, on a show like Idol or other shows where you're sort of, you know, trying to emulate, make a live version of a studio track. So the ability to be able to find the right sounds, to have a good groove, to have a good energy, uh -huh. um, and to be able to read, 
the dots and the chords. Right. You know, um, they're sort of the main... Mm. And, and also, it's just that sort of X factor, you know, um, of being able to sit in a rhythm section mm -hmm. to sort of seamlessly um, get the groove, whatever it is, that whatever the piece is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, in these live environments, there's, you know, there are one or two guitarists recreating a recording where there might be, you know, 12... 24 whatever it is 36 tracks of guitar all yeah. layered up so it's finding what are the essential elements yeah um so they're probably i know i'm focusing on guitar but you know that those are sort of the, the things but yeah the, the obvious things like turning up on time right and, you know and i guess there are also time constraints i mean you need you guys i would think to be able to just pick stuff up quick nail it and then move on to the next one is that right yeah quite often there's not a lot of rehearsal. So, yeah, for shows like, um, you know, for, for all the TV sort of shows, like whether it's back to the day of Idol or Carol's or Logies or whatever, there's no sort of separate day where you go to a band room and learn the tunes or anything like mm. that. It's just you turn up at the venue, the sheet music is put in front of you, there's a rehearsal, you should be able to sight read it. I mean, some players who maybe aren't as comfortable sight reading will request music in advance, you know. And that's not a bad thing to do if mm -hmm. you're in that situation. But um, yeah, just the ability to turn up, sit down, and you know, and do the thing. The yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned carols. I really wanted to ask about that because that just seems like the stress levels must be off the charts. <laughs> I mean, you've got, from what I've seen, you've got a choir, you've got an orchestra, you've got a band, yeah. you've got a live audience, and then you've got a, a live TV audience, yeah. and the whole thing's running live. I mean. How come you don't you don't look your age? How come, <laughs> how come you haven't got a full uh, head of grey hair right uh, now? Uh, well, because no, you know very um, great products that prevent that. From <laughs> you know, it's it's the easiest anti-aging thing in the world, just to whack a bit of old colour in your hair. <laughs> um, but yeah, the that show is great fun, but it probably it's the busiest TV show that I uh, do or have done because of the amount of music involved. You know, for Back in the day of Bert, it would be you know a two and a half hour show with maybe two or three music numbers in it. Carols is wall to wall music, so each segment might have four or five you know pieces of music in it. Um, so yes, it is a big sort of beast to mm -hmm. try and bring um, to life every year. Um, and Yes, there's the big choir, there's, you know, yes, a big orchestra and, and lots of different artists. And, you know, it's tricky because the artists are behind me and, you know, so we don't really have a lot of eye contact. Um, you know, we've all got TV monitors and stuff like that, but it's not quite the same as, you know, the, the, the bulging eyeballs when you can sort of see, all right, this is where mm -hmm. they're taking their breath or this is, you know, what they're intending to do here. And again, that's another one that's pulled together very quickly in terms of the rehearsal schedule. Okay. You know, we'll get one or two runs of each tune okay. and then you're kind of on. So... And you've got a team of people, I would think, helping you do each section. I mean, you've got a leader for the choir and a band leader and so on as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's Uncle Doug, Doug uh, Haywood, who leads the choir. And right. he gets that choir prepared before we get there on the day, which is fantastic. Um, and, you know, I mean, the other thing is I did record, I don't know whether I've still got it somewhere, the, an audio recording of what's going on in my headphones. Because as well as the music, I've got the director's assistant and the director. So the director is the person who's doing the live cut of, okay, camera three, or can you take a close up of Marina? That's it. Oh, back a bit. Oh, good. Okay. Now, can we get a wide shot up the back? Yeah, camera six thing. You know, so that's one voice. And the other voice is, is, is the director's assistant right. who's providing information to the director. One of the trickiest bits is the end of the show because we've got credits rolling and then there's a sort of a Merry Christmas message that comes on and there's the sort of the little Channel 9 um, logo that comes on at the end that sort of signifies that the show's come to a close, you know. Right. And all of this sort of has to happen uh, in a synchronised way. Um, and, you know, depending on how long it's taken for Santa to walk on or if there's a Humphrey Bear, I don't think he's on it anymore, whoever it is. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes these things are a little bit unpredictable. So, you know, if you're ever watching carols, and the very last thing is we wish you a Merry Christmas. If you find it getting sort of unusually slow, 
We wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh-huh. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Wait, that's because the credits haven't finished yet. We've got oh. to sort of slow down. I've got a director's assistant saying, keep going, keep going. Got another 30 seconds. And right. sort of we try to, um, you know, synchronise things such that we end at the same time. So far, it seems to have worked. But yeah, if ever you're, you're watching the show and you think that, that very last carol seems either really fast or really slow, yeah. um, that's the reason. Okay, right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, I also want to ask about your, you've done so much. I mean, you're composing, you've done TV themes. Um, oh, yes, I've done a few, not a lot that you're... Well, not, Chris Lilly. Oh, that's right, yeah, Chris Lilly, that was good. That's fun. tough. How, yeah. does that, how does that work? I mean, what kind of brief do you get? Look, Chris is really fascinating to work with, and he writes a lot of his own music too. He's okay. written his own themes, usually. Um, I think he's written all of the themes for the shows that we've done, so what I've done for him is background music. And he will just kind of describe what he wants. You know, for other shows that I've worked on, they have a finished video and they send it to me and then I write music to go with the pictures. In this case, he wants like a... He's, you know, the way he's worked in the past is he'll have a little library of music that he then chooses, you know, what to put where in, in his, uh, in okay. his works. Okay, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. And what about some of the other... Haven't you done TV themes and stuff like that? What was that TV show I thought you did? The Circle, did you do that? Oh, yes, yes, I wrote a theme for The Circle. That was good, fun okay. to do. And Is it a case of sitting down at piano and just nutting stuff out? I mean, until something you get inspired, how does that work? Yeah, um, I back in the day when I was working on Burt's show, I used Cubase, and that was great. It was really quick. I found it really quick. Um, but I've since it moved over to Pro Tools, and so I'll just sort of, yeah, usually if I'm writing a new thing, I'll either sit at a piano and just hit record on something, you mm-hmm. know, a phone or whatever, and just keep playing until, or, or you know, or, or on a computer so I can see it. Um, I'll just keep recording until a reasonable idea emerges. Um, and sometimes, like, I think it's good just to sort of have those moments where you can just, you know, have free, um, I don't know, what's the word to describe it? Just to sort of brainstorm mm-hmm. musically, to mm-hmm. improvise whether it's at a guitar or at a piano, but to hit record on, say, GarageBand or something, so you can see the waveform, mm-hmm. and you're not, you know, it's, it's, it feels like it's an informal process. It doesn't have the formality of a Pro Tool session. You just, it's just you, and you hit record, and you just play for a bit. And I think sometimes, you know, you, you'll look back and say, oh, that, that bit's interesting, that bit's interesting, this bit's no good at all. And, you know, sometimes, depending on what it is you're doing, it's good to come back to it after an hour. Sometimes it's good to come back to it after a day. Mm -hmm. Um, But for those sort of TV things where really what they're looking for is a quickly identifiable hook, it's not, you know, you're not creating the right of spring or anything particularly, (laughs) you know. Uh It's nothing, you know, nothing that anyone's going to write about in the history of, you know, great music, yeah. but, but the, you know, that they're, they're, they're worthwhile things to write from a copyright point of view. If you can, you know, it, if you can get a theme or something that's used regularly on television, um, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable source of income yeah. for people. So, um, I mean, it's been a while since I've had a theme on TV, but they, they're, um, yeah, oh, is that... Somebody doing an impersonation of Graham Kennedy. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're good things to be able to, to be able to do, and yeah, they've been they've been fun. Things. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably a lot of young people maybe going to see this, want to get into the want to get into the industry. Yeah. But it's changed so much in just the last twenty years. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, what? But yet there is still a lot. I mean, you do orchestration, you do arranging, you do composing, everything. What what kind of re, what kind of advice do, would you give young people who are about to finish high school at uni, yeah. want to do what you're doing. Well, yeah, look, it's tricky, but yeah, to, to do the sorts of things that I'm doing, I reckon that the best piece of advice, I would say, is to get as much knowledge as you can about your particular instrument and what it is you want to do. So if you want to become an arranger, you know, get really fluent with whether it's Finale or Sibelius or whatever program you want to use. Or if you want to be a producer, you know, get really fluent with whatever digital audio workstation you want to use. Um, You know, if you're a saxophone player, that's great. 
if you're a saxophone player who also doubles on clarinet and can play flute and can sight read classical music and can play jazz, where you've just sort of quadrupled the amount of work you could potentially get. Yeah. So that's one thing, is getting the knowledge you need in order to get the, the maximum amount of work. Right. But the other thing is, you know, I mean, you can call it networking, you can call it friendships, you can call it, you know, whatever you like, but the, you know, the person who you're working with at uni now may be the person that's your employer or employee next week, next uh -huh. month, next year, you know. Like the, the drummer, for example, on Idol was uh, Gordon Rittmeister, uh -huh. brilliant, brilliant drummer. Yeah. But, you know, one of the first times I worked with him was when he helped me out for my year 12 assessment. I had to do a, you know, a, a chamber music piece. So I thought, oh, this will be fun. I'll do a jazz trio just right. to kind of, you know, shake things up. I'll call it chamber music because it, it is, but it's piano-based drums. And so Gordon played for that. We, you know, he may be maybe one year older than me or something like that. So when Idol came around, might have been 10, 15 years later, he seemed like the obvious person mm -hmm. to call for that particular gig. So you just never know. The person who you're doing a gig with today might end up... Uh, oh, and, and, you know, the other thing is, you know, we're talking about TV themes and stuff like that. If people want to write for TV or for movies or whatever, again, when you're at that student level... Interact with other students that are doing that. You know, mm -hmm. the person that's directing a student film that wants you to do some music for it, and you think, oh, God, is this worth it? It's going to be a hell of a lot of work, and blah, blah, blah. That person may end up being the next, you know, Steven Spielberg. You just yeah. don't yeah, know, know where, you know, where your future gigs are going to come from. So I'd say, you know, gather as much information as you can about the specific topics that you want to specialize in or the spe uh, specific areas that you want to be able to work on. And then just meet as many people as you can and work with as many people as you can in those areas. Um, because, and you don't necessarily always need to be working with people that are at the top of their game. No. The people you're working with right now may well be the people that, you know, lead you to the path. Yeah. You know? Sure. And I suppose the other thing is, um, you know, um, a lot of people who I see who are able to eke out a long-term career in music are people that, especially in this country, that are able to do a, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, can sing and play guitar on your own, or you can play in a band, well, you've just doubled yeah. your work opportunities, yeah. you know, and, and that, that applies to anybody. Um, so the more stuff you can do, the more potential work yeah. you get. Okay. One particular artist I really want to ask about was Burt Bacharach, because I know you did a live TV special with him. I love his yeah. music. Everyone loves his music. And what did you take from working with him? What did you see? I mean, apart from the fact he's clearly a genius, but let's put that aside for a moment. Yeah. What was it that's... why? What was so brilliant about him? Did you get anything that... Well, look, he, he is a really down-to-earth guy, yeah. you know, and once I saw him interact with the audience, so basically this was a show where we had, you know, a bunch of Australian artists singing his songs, then we did an interview, and then he got up at the end and sang Alfie, yeah. one of the great songs uh -huh. of all time. And so just seeing him kind of interact with the orchestra, he knew what he was doing, he knew how to bring them in, he knew... He knew the technical side of what needed to be achieved. I mean, you can tell that by listening to his music. Uh -huh. It's clear that he has, you know, such an amazing harmonic knowledge. Well, he sounds like a studied musician. He's not... Yeah. He, he is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And when when you actually meet him and when you see him interact with the orchestra, he's just another muso, you know. He's right. just a down-to-earth uh -huh. kind of guy. And I think that's great. It's just very refreshing to, to see that. So I was, uh, you know, I felt very... Um, very lucky to be able to meet him and um, yeah I I just um, continue to be a huge fan yeah right okay yeah. all right all right is there anyone else that you haven't worked with that you'd, you'd really love to work with any names you I mean you've worked with so many people yeah no that's a good question I'll um, I'll take that on notice and come back to you okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah no, sure. that's a good question um I mean I, yeah I um, yeah I don't know no? I mean, I always love working with new people. Okay. And, you know, there's always something new to learn. Mm -hmm. I just did a gig with William Barton, brilliant 
um, Yadaki player or didgeridoo as uh-huh. known in English. And yeah, um, that I mean, I'm just saying that's that, that's the most recent sort of gig okay. that I've done, and that was that was great fun. Because I yeah. thought I read once that you wanted to were keen on working with Daniel Johns from Silverchair. Oh yeah. I've Did been, you ever get to do that? No, I've never worked with him. I've right. been a big fan of his for yeah. years, and I love the way that his um, he was able to combine, you know rock music with orchestra you know i yeah. thought that was fantastic yeah. the, you know the production on on those albums yeah i've been a big fan is there anyone that you kind of throughout the history of composition you know dead or alive that you would have loved to have met and worked with i love oh. love to have met it at the very least any classical composers it's funny yeah i i um i was doing one of those little um online um what do you call it not scrabble like a, a crossword thing and one of the clues was you know uh, voted greatest composer of all time, and it was four letters. And I thought it's probably Bach, mm. and so I put it in. It was the correct answer. Mm-hmm. And I sort of think there's something about Bach's music that is really intriguing, and that whole era where you've got, you know, uh, a thing called figured bass, which I don't know whether guitarists would necessarily be aware of, but basically you, it, it, it's the the Baroque period equivalent of a chord chart. So yeah. that the players would actually kind of jam. They'd be improvising to a certain extent around the chords that had been pre-written. Yeah. So there's something about that era that I find particularly uh, fascinating. So yes, if I could go back in time and I would need a translator, but yes, if I could meet one composer, I reckon it would be, be him. It would be Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we've been sitting here in front of this... Piano, the John Foreman piano. Oh, yes. Yeah, what can you tell us about this? This was... This is the JF125, yes. Yeah, available now at Exclusive Pianos. Um, not that... It's a, that store is called Exclusive Pianos? Where yes, they can that's it? right. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, no, th- this uh, came out, I think, just before COVID. Brilliant timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, th- this is... Um, there's, there's two. There's a... I think 125 centimetre and 123 centimetre. It's very hard to talk about this without it sounding like an advertorial. Go so ahead. No, no, no. I don't want to... Sales turn, pitch away. No, I don't want to turn your show into a, into an ad, but um, they're available now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just thought it would be a fun thing to do to, to kind of work on a design of a piano that... Um, this one's a bit out of tune, actually. We haven't tuned... I haven't tuned it for a couple of years, but that has sort of, you know, the bright presence of, uh, you know... A contemporary sounding piano but the warmth of you know a um a traditional kind of sound so oh, it's okay. got, yeah it's got german strings it's got the european uh, what do you call it hammer things and, 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 a, and a do you still do you still yeah. practice at all do you actually practice or is it just uh, time spent very, working no, it's, it's interesting i i um i was doing a chat with uh james morrison the brilliant mm-hmm. trumpet player it was a couple of years ago and we were talking to some music teachers and the interviewer said you know what music do you have on in the car and I said oh I've been embarrassed to say this but I don't like I'll either have silence in the car or like talk radio or something because if I've spent all day working on something musical I don't really want to listen to music after that it's a terrible thing to say but (laughs) you know and James said the same thing really you know when you've spent if you have spent all day whether it's you know with a chart in front of you or listening to pieces of music, trying to work out what to do with them. When that's finished, I'll want to do something else. Yeah. So I probably should do more practice. I probably should have spent more time during COVID practicing. <laughs> um, I will practice for an event. You know, if there's something that I need to work on for a particular event, I'll... I'll You'll work up I to it. Work up to that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll wind up there, John. Thanks very much for doing that. That was really interesting. I thought a lot of people are going to enjoy all your advice and information and stories. Well, look, thank you for having me on your, your show. As I said before, I feel a bit of an imposter on the Guitar Channel because I can't <laughs> play the guitar at all. I've tried a few times and I'm, you know. No. So thank you for making an exception. That's right. You've got Rex case. Go, who I interviewed exactly. once before. Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's fantastic. Brilliant. Hopefully he sees this. Yeah. All right, guys, please like, share, and subscribe. If you like this video, share it round. Subscribe if you're not, and I'll see you in next week's video. Bye.